All right, uh, welcome back to objective two. Uh, you're confronted here with a bit of a strange picture. And in objective two, what we're doing is being able to tell if a relation is a function or not. We, we've talked about relations as just pairing up inputs and outputs, two different numbers, but a function is going to be you pair them up in a special way. Okay, so functions in math class are, are often related to vending machines. Um, and uh, that's what you have right here in the picture is a vending machine. So this picture is from some sort of um, work safety campaign in Canada, I think. And so, uh, I, I mean, I've worked at factories before. Sometimes it can be pretty dangerous and they're, they're, you know, they really want you to be safe because you can lose a finger, you could lose an eye, whatever. And so this is really hitting at home that, all right, well, here you are in your break room and one of the vending machines is a replacement arm, hand, foot, whatever. It's, uh, I, I think it's pretty, like, it would be effective as, as um, like a safety campaign. Anyway, so aside from that, the vending machine side is that, uh, let's say I'm at the workplace and I just lost myself a thumb. It's my left thumb, right? I just lost it in a machine. So I go to the vending machine to replace it because, you know, I can do that. And I, I press the buttons with this thumb because that one's gone uh, with this thumb to get that thumb back. And what comes out is a toe. And I'm going to be pretty upset because I didn't want the toe. I wanted the thumb. I guess you could attach a toe to that. It'd, it'd be silly, but whatever. So the point is, is that whenever you select one out input, there's only one possible output that could come out. When I select thumb, left thumb, a thumb doesn't come out, right? And this is the general idea for a function. So here's a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. Absolutely, um, you know, precious to me. You know that from your, your survival guide or whatever. So Calvin, in the morning, is going, you want to see something weird? I'm saying that to Hobbes. Watch. You put bread in this slot and you push down the lever. And then a few minutes later, toast pops up. Wow, where does the bread go? Asks Hobbes. And Calvin's like, mm, beats me, isn't that weird? And I, I, I put this in here because, uh, well, I've got a couple questions for you. Like, um, like what, what does like any appliance represent? It represents a function. A toaster is a function. Your washer and dryer would be a function because it performs one task. You stick something in and something else comes out of it. Toaster is an example of a function. You put in bread, the toaster performs a toasting function, and then out pops toasted bread, right? Shouldn't be like some sort of magical mystery. So what comes out of a toaster? There's a question. What comes out of a toaster? Well, you would say toast. Well, that's true as long as you put bread in it, right? It depends on what you put in. Because if you put in bread, toast comes out, toasted bread. But if you put in a frozen waffle, then you know, a toasted waffle comes out, right? So the idea behind a function is you can't input bread and expect a waffle to come out. Mm, it's not going to happen. Just like uh, at the beginning of this, when I'm talking about I, I selected my left thumb, I don't want the toe to come out whenever I make that purchase. Okay. All right, so here is then the mathematical definition of a function. Function is a type of relation, so we are pairing up inputs and outputs, domain and range, in which every input has how many outputs? Exactly one output. You only paired up with one thing over here. The button, let's call it B3, when I click the B3 button, only the left thumb comes out, and that's the only thing that comes out. Functions are a dependent relationship, or relation. What that means is the output depends on what you put in. On the toaster, what comes out of the toaster? Well, it depends on what you put into it to begin with. So in this little egg Venn diagram, you have on the outside all the relations, and on the inside of that, a subset are the functions, which are showing you that every single function is a relation, but not every single relation can be a function, okay? So it, it's a little bit more strict. Sure, it's a relation, so I'm pairing up two numbers, but how am I pairing it? 
I'm pairing it so that every input has just one output. Right. Okay. Now, here's a, here's a tricky situation, though. Just because every input has just one output, that does not mean that every output has one input. That doesn't have to be the case. It's not in the definition at all. Let me show you an example, something that you may remember from the end of Algebra 1, and that's just like a parabola. Let me draw it right up here above my head. So here's a graph, a parabola, terrible looking parabola, but whatever. So let's say that uh, this right here represents the number 2, and I know that it outputs to a 4. Um, this input of 2 only goes to the number 4. But now let's look backwards. If I look at the output of 4, what was the original input that went with it? It could be this positive 2 over here on the right-hand side, but I also have one on the left-hand side, which is a negative 2. It has two different inputs that I could have gotten that from. Okay, and that one is still a function, and that's okay. okay. So, here's another way to think of this. So, if you think of inputs as boys hmm, and uh, an output as a girl, then you have a function when every boy has one and only one girlfriend. Otherwise, that boy is going to get into some big trouble. Okay? So, let's look at these two pictures right here. On the left hand side, you have Darth Vader. He has only one girlfriend, that stormtrooper. And uh, that is a functional relation. So one input, that input goes with just one output. However, on the right-hand side, this is a non-functional relation. In other words, this is not a function because Darth Vader is going to two different chicks. He's got two different girlfriends, two different outputs. So it can't be a function. Okay. So let's look at a, another case where this is still a function. So which ones are the inputs? The inputs are the boys, and so we're going to say the stormtroopers this time are the boys. Back here, they were the girls. Anyway, so the stormtroopers are the boys, and then that girl right there in the middle, let's take a picture with it, that's the uh, output. That output has two inputs that um, she's paired up with. Okay, so, and, and that's still a function. This is like the, the parabola case. Okay, so keep that in mind, that it's still a function. So, what does a function look like? Here are all the representations, the multiple, res multiple ways that you could represent a function. Sometimes we could see it as a list of ordered pairs, as we've seen the relations before, a table of values, and sometimes one of these is going to be more helpful than another. Sometimes you, you know, they're just as helpful as the other, or sometimes they're not helpful at all. Anyway, so a mapping diagram. We could put it in words. I'm sure everybody would probably say that that's the least helpful way to see a function, but you could see it in a paragraph, a verbal description. You could take that verbal description, you could write it as an equation with y and x, x being inputs, y being outputs, or you could take that equation and you could put it in function notation. And notice, of course, with function notation, it just replaces y with this thing, which is f of x, just the name of the function. It means the same thing as y. Or perhaps I could uh, graph the thing, and the graph always gives me a nice representation of the whole entire function, like wh how is every single member of that set, those two sets, paired up. Okay. All right. So um, let me see what time it is. Okay, I still have a little bit of time. Let's look at a couple of exercises here. We're just seeing is it a function, and then if it is a function, let's list out, well, even if it's not, let's list out the domain and the range. Okay, so table A, if you can see these teeny, teeny, tiny little numbers in this table, let's look just first, is this thing a function? Let's see, 1 goes with 2, 2 goes with 4, 3 goes with 6. Every input has just one output. Every girl only, or every boy has only one uh, one girlfriend, so this is a function. And now let's list the domain and the range. So the domain, just have the numbers 1, 2, and 3. 1, 2, and 3. And the range, we have the numbers 2, 4, and 6. 2, 4, and 6. Okay, 
piece of cake. Why don't you pause the video and do the same thing for table B and table C. Determine is it a function and then whether or not it is or not list out the domain and the range for me. Okay, pause. Right, so let's see if those things were functions. Table B, table C, were they functions? What's their domain and the range? So table B, it wasn't a function. The reason why it wasn't a function is because the number one is the input pairs up with one and here at the end it also pairs up five. So it's like the boy, one input, is paired up with two girlfriends. One, I guess that's himself, and the number five. Okay, so it can't be a function. But we could still list out the domain and the range uh, for that function. You have zero, one, and for the range, one, two, and five. Okay, table C, that one is all, this one is a function. Okay, and you might go, oh, but what about the fact that they're, they're all going to zero? That's okay, remember, because every input has just one output. What does the number one go with? Just zero. Doesn't go with anything else. Number two just goes with zero. In each one of these cases, every boy has only one girlfriend. It's just that they all seem to have the same girlfriend. Okay, so it still makes a function. All right, so here's a follow-up question. You hear that in the hallway? Anyway, the size of a set is called its cardinality. That just means how many things, how many elements are in the set. If I go back to the previous slide, let's look at the range on table A. There are one, two, three. Two, four, and six, there are three things in the range. Its cardinality is three. That's what we're talking about. That's all it is. Second part of it, what must be true about the cardinalities of the domain and the range of any function? Well, that's pretty tough to answer, like without having any examples or whatever. So let's look back at these examples and see if we can come up with something. Okay, so let's look at table A. It was a function, and how many things were in the domain? There were three of them. And in the range, there were also three of them. So it, both of those, the cardinality was three. Let's look at table B. On table B, the cardinality is two, and in the range, there are three things in there. Okay, all right. And on table C, there were six things in the domain, but only one thing in the range. Okay, is there, is there anything those numbers have to do with each other? And here's what it is. Let's talk about whether they're the same or whether one of them is bigger than the other one. Look at table A. They have the same number. They have three in each of them. The domain is the same size as the range. This is the way that I write it. It looks like absolute value. I put the domain in those absolute value brackets, but in this case, the notation means cardinality. It's the same size as the range. It didn't have the same numbers in it, the same you know, items, but it has the same number of things in it. Okay, table B, uh, domain is smaller. It's got two things, and the range has three things. So the domain, its cardinality is less than the range. Right? Right. Okay, and then finally, I got six things versus one. The domain here is, is bigger than the range. So the relationship now is, well, let's look at the one that's really sticking out here, which is not a function. The one that's not a function, the domain is smaller than the range. But on the other two, it's either equal to it, the domain is either equal to the range, or it's bigger than the, the range. And this demonstrates what in mathematics is called the pigeonhole principle. The pigeonhole principle kind of goes like this. Let's say I have two mailboxes, right? And I have, as a mailman, I've got three pieces of mail. Let me just number them. One, two, and three. I've got three pieces of mail that I'm going to stick into those two mailboxes. What conclusion can you draw? Right? You don't have to be a genius. You just think about it for a second. If I'm delivering mail, what conclusion? So what's going to be true? You start delivering. Let's deliver some mail. Number one, let's put that one in that box. 
Number two, hey, that's addressed over here. And then I've got one other piece of mail. Where does it have to go? It has to go into one of the other two boxes. So let's just say it went into this one. What the pigeonhole principle is saying is that if you have two mailboxes and only three, and you have three pieces of mail to put them in there, um, at least one of the mailboxes is going to have more than one piece of mail in it. And that's what's happening in table B. The range here is our mail and our domain are our mailboxes. And I've got three pieces of mail to stick with only two holes. One of them has to pair up twice. One boy has to have two girlfriends and then he just got in trouble and it can't be a function. All this to say, in order to be a function in terms of the domain and the range, the size of the domain has to be greater or equal to the size of the range. If it's not, if it's less, then it, there's no way that it could be a function. Okay.